You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests, and good to see you, Mike. Glad to be breathing air again another week here in Hotel Pacifico. It's good to be back. Uh, this is a special, this is going to be a fun, really packed day at Hotel Pacifico. And for the first time, we're actually moving into the vote-rich suburbs. Uh, and we'll be joined by someone who always finds a way to have his voice heard. Uh, and he'll be doing that for the first time here on Hotel Pacifico. From there, we'll join Jeff in the strategy suite where, he'll, where he will give us our, his take on uh, Councillor Christine Boyle and how she reached the summit of Little Mountain with a nice little push from BC's First Lady, Dr. Kay Kaylee Lynch. Uh, we have a clipping of the week today, too. I think I use the term clipping a bit loosely. We can have a bit of a debate when we get to the suite on that one. Uh, but we will be talking about uh, Clean BC and MNP. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about fundraising and the latest polls, some creative spin on those latest polls, and get Mike's take on where the divide on the right is going. Uh, and guests, we'll try and cram in a little bit on the credit downgrade, uh, but as you can probably tell, the hotel is really at full, full capacity today. So, you know, we'll be lining up the shots and we'll be probably having some glasses at the end of it at the mini bar. So moving forward to our guests, we are rebranding Hotel Pacifico as Hotel Pacifico today. Our guest is Brad West, the mayor of Port Coquitlam. While Port Coquitlam may not be the biggest city in the suburbs, there aren't many mayors who have a bigger megaphone. Brad West has created a personal brand around suburban populism that doesn't exactly fit perfectly into a provincial or federal political party. Uh, welcome to Hotel Pacifico, uh, Mayor Brad West. Thank you very much for having me. I just want to note that you are west of Maple Ridge. This is which correct. Is, which is where I grew up. And I take solace in the fact that when you look to the mountains, you're looking at the Golden Ears, and you're welcome. Is that like the lamest pun anyone's done with your last name? Uh, it, it would be in the top three for sure. Way to go, Mike. Hey, look, I'm always nice representing Maple Ridge. But you know what? <laughs> as soon as I go down that list... Of uh, Cam Neely, Larry Walker, Jim Robson, uh, you can stop me short with Terry Fox, right there. Absolutely, over my shoulder. People That's right. Do that I assume, but uh, no probably the, the portrait of our hometown hero in my office, Terry Fox. Uh, but no, Maple Ridge is kind of like a cousin to Port Coquitlam, uh, so we we like people from Maple Ridge, Mike. Well, that's good. Well, we used to beat you in soccer all the time, but you know, you know, you guys tried hard. Well, um, <laughs> and, and anyways, I'll leave it at that. Um, why, you know, you don't even have a Wikipedia page. And, and I was thinking like, why, why is uh, at least that I could find? Um, why, uh, why do we hear so much from you? You know, you're just, you know, little, little old Poco out there in the suburbs, but yet uh, we always seem to have Brad West um, on the radio or in the newspaper. You always have something to say. What's your secret? I guess, well, I guess I have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that probably helps. Um, you know, I have some pretty strong opinions uh, about our province, about our communities, about our country. And uh, have never been shy about expressing those. Um, I, I think that's expected of me by the people of Port Coquitlam. Um, these are issues that have impacts on their daily lives. And when I feel in particular that there's not another voice that is articulating those concerns, or maybe not articulating them in a way that I think is on the money, then I've never hesitated to step up and, and to try and give some voice to those concerns and those issues. Um, you know, I, I should say for the record, that's always secondary to my primary responsibility of mayor, which is ensuring that the city runs well. We're providing high quality services. We're respectful of our taxpayers and we're delivering on the core responsibilities of the municipality. But I think Port Coquitlam has distinguished itself in that regard. Uh, and we have a really strong track record. And I have residents all the time coming up and, and you know, expressing their appreciation for the work that the city is doing. So uh, while being very focused on that primary responsibility, I also have taken upon myself, as you noted, to, um, to 
make comments and to draw attention to issues that I think need attention drawn to them. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tuck into that a bit and offer maybe a theory why going back to my roots as a reporter, why I might come to you for, for a quote on something on an issue. Um, and it goes back to, to what I mentioned in the intro. So sometimes when you're weighing in on issues, people's reactions can be a bit predictable because of their kind of political alignments and sort of their kind, they can be seen sometimes maybe as towing a political line. And you, I think, are someone where there's a genuine kind of like, where's he going to land on this one? Uh, there's a genuine kind of sense that you're going to come from a place that might be surprising rather than something that was handed down to you by any kind of political alignment. Does that feel fair? Oh, very fair. Yeah. Um, I I certainly don't take uh, orders or don't have, uh, you know, uh, a message box sent to me and, and, and to stick to this. Uh, I say what I think and and I believe what I say. And it's informed not by any particular political alignment uh, with a party, it's informed on, first and foremost, my values, what I believe in as a person. And obviously, that's been shaped by my my upbringing and uh, family and, and friends and my own experiences. Um, and I also say what I say on, uh, on the basis of what I'm hearing from the public um, and what I'm hearing from my residents and what I'm observing and what they're telling me. A good example, I think, of this is uh, when Porco Quitlam got into a bit of a showdown with the province over uh, drug decriminalization. And when people started articulating concerns about seeing an uptick in public drug use and drug use in very inappropriate places, uh, the province's first reaction was to kind of, well, just very dismissive. Nope, that's not happening. Nope, there's no data. Nope, you have no proof that's happening. Uh, but I knew it was happening. I knew it was happening because I saw it with my own eyes when I was out in the community with uh, my two young kids and my wife, and we'd be at parks and, and playgrounds. And you, you know, not all the time, luckily in Port Coquitlam, uh, not all the time, but there would be instances when it was happening. And I would hear from other parents. Um, I, like I said, I have two young kids. I have a, a seven year old and a soon to be three year old. And so uh, my social circle is a lot of young families. So I would hear from, other parents, hey, like I had this experience at this park. So I knew that was happening. That is the reality. And no matter what any spin doctor in Victoria wanted to say, that's what was happening. And so I said, we're going to do something about it. And, you know, it's as simple as that. I, I don't take into consideration in these issues. Oh, you know, is this going to is this going to annoy someone in government? Mm -hmm. Like. Too bad. This is the reality that we're dealing with. And uh, I'm going to articulate that and take action to try and address it to the best of my ability. So can I, I think that's a really interesting position to start with, because because um, I know some of what you articulated, I think, very effectively about your position on, on safe supply um, was about sort of the delta sometimes between academics and real life right? That like something can work in terms of the research, but in practice be a bit flawed. And I want to pick that apart a little bit, because I want to say, you know, as someone um, who, you know, in other places, and in, in many ways, you know, you've been labeled a progressive. Um, and there are sort of this, this chorus of the, the experts, the white tower academics don't know what they're talking about can be very much a tool of the right to say, I'm going to dismiss this. I don't like what they're saying. Ergo, climate change isn't real and vaccines are going to make me sick. Right. Um, so can you pull that apart for me? Because I thought that position in particular was kind of interesting in how it more typically is used in that way. Would you say in this case, when you're talking about safe supply, there's a different application you're using there of ignore the experts. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, I would say that, well, I believe it's important to listen to expertise, uh, however you wish to define that. Um, expertise is often defined by uh, academic credential, um, and there's probably a whole, a whole thing there we could delve into, but, um, expertise, uh, self-proclaimed expertise is, I think, one voice to listen to. Uh, I, I certainly don't ignore the opinions of those who, um, articulate a certain position on the basis of, 
uh, their, their education and research. Uh, however, I do think that it's also important to not just put blind faith into that, but into but also to be cognizant and very alive to the execution of things and how they're playing out in in the ground. It's really easy to I think theorize how certain things should work, but life is complicated, and people are complicated, and things don't always go go according to plan. There's complexities. There are certain realities that occur on the ground, and they're often outside of the view of the, quote, experts. And so I think uh, the voice of a parent in Port Coquitlam who is trying to have their child's 10-year-old birthday party but gets inter interrupted because someone is smoking crack in the middle of the birthday party in a playground and tells the parents to F off when they say, can you please not do that here? I think it's just as important to listen to that voice. And so that that's the distinction uh, I would make is there are people who will theorize uh, and tell you this is what we should do and this is why. And in an academic sense, it may make perfect sense, but it's translation into reality and human life uh, I think can often get a little rocky. And when that happens, I don't think the answer or response to that needs to be, well, uh, no, you're not experiencing what you think you are. You're not seeing what you think you are. Um, or, you know, I remember one person and, and that incident I described about the birthday party is, uh, is a, a real one. Uh, someone said, well, you should have taken that as a teachable moment for your child. But I, I just reject that sort of uh, of thinking. So, um, so I do think that there's a balance there. And um, I would say progressives, which is a label I do not apply to myself, by the way. Uh, but progressives, um, I think, often have a blind spot when it comes to how uh, these theories or programs or initiatives are playing out in in reality. What label do you apply to yourself? Well, I'm not a big label guy, but um, I I kind of uh, cheekily is it, refer to is myself. It, uh, Kirkland? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, right. that's right. Well, I do like a good Costco trip. Uh, uh -huh. Number one tourist attraction in Poco, Costco. Uh, <laughs> you would know that, Mike, as a Maple Ridge native. Um, I uh, sometimes I like to refer to myself as a populist just because it makes people, oh my, yeah. oh my goodness, a populist, uh, you know, and I don't see anything wrong with a, a bit of populism. I, I, I identify with that. We've had a, a, we've had a couple of populists on this show, uh, self, self-styled Glenn Clark comes to mind. We yeah, an episode does not of, pass uh, and we don't mention Glenn Clark at least once, but, uh, <laughs> Mike's uh, still I'm, licking his wounds. I'm still scarred. Um, <laughs> But let's let's talk about the suburbs. And there's a lot of diversity within the suburbs. Diversity, not just in terms of ethnic diversity, but just no one community is the same as the other. Um, but, you know, it's been our, I think, tradition in British Columbia politics for the last few couple of generations that elections are decided in the suburbs. Um, and uh, certainly uh, in the election I was most involved in 2013, we made gains in the suburbs. And then in 2017, Horgan made gains in the suburbs. And those were deciding events for those elections. So tell us, in your view, what is on the minds of people in your community and the Tri-Cities and suburbs generally? Like, what, what are the vote-determining issues you think going into this fall? Well, I, I think the cost of living is at the top of the list. Um, and, and I hear this all the time. I mean, I'm, I experience it in my own family, trying to pay our mortgage, plan, trying to uh, pay expensive childcare costs, um, having to fuel up the vehicle, trying to keep the kids in the different sports activities that they want. I mean, that then throw groceries on top of it. I mean, <laughs> trying to balance all of that is no small feat. Um, you know, and, and I'm fortunate that, I, you know, my wife works part time We're you know, we're, we're kind of a middle class family, um, or at least what would be thought of as a middle class family. And, you know, a lot of friends and folks I have in my social circle, 
uh, all of them are feeling that pinch and that struggle and, and feeling like it's harder to get ahead. Um, no matter, you know, no matter how much saving you do, you know, uh, you, you skip the proverbial latte, you know, all the, the things that they say you need to do. Um, it's just incredibly hard to get ahead, uh, to try and get a little bit of savings established to, you know, to try and, um, provide for your family. And so without a doubt, that's the number one thing I, I hear about. I have a great deal of sensitivity to it in terms of how I run the city of Port Coquitlam and have looked for opportunities to provide meaningful relief to people. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note that uh, Port Coquitlam, since I became mayor, has moved from about the middle of the pack of the 21 cities in Metro Vancouver with respect to property taxes to now having the lowest property taxes of mm. the 21 cities that make up Metro Vancouver. If you live in Poco, you're paying on average $1,500 less every year than the average Metro Vancouver property taxpayer. Um, that's significant money to a family. Uh, we've tried to do so things. Why, like why, why do you think you're going down the list, relatively speaking? Does that say as much about the other municipalities as it does yeah. say about Well, it? I think it's because we're, we're holding the line. Yeah. Uh, and... Other municipalities are, you know, posting increases that are seven, eight, nine, double digit percent, whereas, you know, we're at that two percent, three percent. And we probably don't have enough time to delve into all the reasons why. But I'm just making the point that just get into the ABCs of it. Yeah, the, the, uh, the affordability. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, the affordability uh, piece, the cost of living is, is huge. And so I think. Uh, how that is going to play out in the election is there's a real heightened sensitivity to costs increasing. And uh, certainly I think we have seen that and we are seeing that as it relates to the most recent carbon tax increase. Um, you know, some of the past carbon tax increases have passed with, you know, maybe a little blip, but not, you know, not a lot of attention. Whereas this one, has had significant attention. Now, part of that, I think, is because of what's happening federally and um, mm -hmm. federal conservatives and policy have highlighting it. Um, but but I think that uh, the BC NDP have a real vulnerability with respect to this issue uh, because I'm hearing about it from uh, friends and, and family and people who are not um, politically disinclined to supporting the NDP provincially, uh, mm -hmm. but are kind of like, how could this be happening at this time? Right. So yeah. I think those yeah. issues are uh, very so, much um, in the line so, of suburban. So Mayor, um, it's just the three of us here. <laughs> and um, I was just wondering what you and Polly have talked about at that time. <laughs> well, I have to keep those conversations private, Mike. Oh, okay. Um, uh, just, we talked just the three of us. <laughs> just like, just, just yeah. Some like observations, not on substance, maybe on tenor, anything. What was anything? he wearing? Yeah. Did he make a knock knock joke? Are his puns as bad as Mike's? There were there were no jokes. It was strictly business. Uh, no, we we, uh, we I've had the opportunity to meet him a couple times. He came in, visited me here in Port Coquitlam, and uh, we have. He certainly looks like the presumptive prime minister a year out, anyways, right now. Like, uh, you know, it, you never know, know and but everyone here is a political animal and knows that a lot can change. But um, at this point, that looks like a pretty safe bet, doesn't it? And Ian, Ian Black's running in your riding, I think, federally. That's correct. For the conservatives. So they're hoping to take that seat that overlaps mainly with Poco, I think. Um, yeah, it actually encompasses all of the city of Port Coquitlam and then a, a portion of Coquitlam. Right. But there is a, a, a bit of a Venn diagram there, obviously. I mean, you mentioned the carbon tax. Um, he, 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 yeah, he's driven a lot of that debate. You've come, I heard you recently on CKNW and your comments on uh, why you oppose the carbon tax and you obviously tied it into cost of living there. I mean, it does I, I've kind never of- ups... support, I've never supported it right back to when your government and party introduced it just to channel a little bit of Glenn Clark there. Yeah. Well, is there, an, is there on that, on that, like- 
I wanted to kind of pull apart two things in here and what you said, because I think you pointed to the fact that there's just a lot of context that means this particular, at this moment in time, there's just a lot of attention on the carbon tax when really the cost of things going up is much bigger than that. There's a lot of things driving that. And we're sort of um, maybe um, over indexing, maybe not in terms of politics, but over indexing in terms of impact on this one piece. Um, I want to kind of marry that with a question. Like, do you, do you, if we're going to stay focused on this, is there somewhere else we can go? If the carbon tax is just such a political albatross at this point, what else would you do to uh, recognize the cost of emissions? So I think there's a, a couple of things there. First, I mean, my opposition to the carbon tax is not informed by uh, a political calculation that uh, it's become unpopular. As I said, I've, I've always opposed it um, because I do believe that it greatly impacts uh, working and middle-class families more than anyone else. If you're wealthy, you can afford a carbon tax increase and you're not even going to notice it. But if you're kind of on the edge, you know, you're a middle-class family and you live in the suburbs and you're not well served by public transit. And so you have to drive because you got to get your kids to school and you got to get one kid to daycare. And then you got to get to work and then you got to pick the kids up and then you got to get them to hockey practice. And then you got to get groceries. I'm sorry, but doing that on a bike or on a bus is just not practical and it's not reality. So you have to drive, you know, particularly, as I say, if you're in the suburbs. And so now you're going to have to pay more to do that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that carbon tax proponents are a little bit shy and quiet about is the fact that the whole point is to have the carbon tax go up again and again and again and again and again because it by design it's supposed to make gas more expensive so you're you have no choice but you're forced to find some alternative that to my view doesn't realistically exist um that's why i oppose it um now what should we do as an alternative well i think there's a couple things first we should have a, a massive expansion of public transit in our region. If you live in Port Coquitlam, for example, and you want to take the bus, uh, you know, your options are to get on a bus that comes, if you're lucky, once every 30 minutes and take some long meandering route to where you need to go. Um, you know, if you live in Langley, if you live in Maple Ridge, if you live in large parts of our region, where by the way, most of the population growth is occurring, transit is an afterthought. So I would have a massive expansion of public, public transit to provide people a realistic alternative. And if you are gonna have a carbon tax, it should be directed to something that people think is tangible and they can actually see an outcome. And I think that that is one of the other challenges that the government's faced with. They say that they're using the carbon tax revenue for you know, various climate related things, but I don't think that people see that. They don't feel it. Um, it you know, I, I can certainly speak with some authority on the transit piece. Um, you know, if carbon tax revenue is coming to TransLink, I must have missed it, or it's coming in the most roundabout way that no one is noticing. So, you know, those are the types of things that that I would do. Um, and and maybe if we got to a place where our region had the type of transit system that could deliver people realistic alternatives, at that point, then maybe you know, in my view, maybe there's a role for a a carbon tax or something similar. So we, um, we clearly in the absence get, of that, yeah. I think you, you are just, you are punishing people in that kind of working to middle class bracket who have no choice but to drive. And unless something changes, it's just going to continue to increase year over year. So clearly we have to get you and Glenn Clark together because you've arrived at the exact same conclusion with this. Um, but I think, I mean, it's interesting because the line of thinking you shared at kind of the outset of sort of, um, you know, the, the taxation needs to lead to something very concrete, I think is a lot of the thinking behind the carbon tax. Um, and, you know, certainly like 
it's different how it manifests in BC because we have an income tested return. But, you know, in most of the country, they sort of banked on the idea or the most of the rest of the country. Right. Like it's actually the idea that like the concrete thing is a check that families are getting uh, quarterly with some proportion. Right. Set aside for 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 transition investments. Right. Um, but following your logic on and Glenn Clark's logic on the transit piece, um, it's still really expensive. Like if we're going to make that investment to the scale that we're going to drastically reduce emissions, like, you know, that's billions and billions and billions of dollars. Um, are you like, are you saying that um, if it was the kind of infrastructure that really reached out across, say, Metro Vancouver and really made it suddenly viable for everyone to 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 live that way? That that would reach the reach the ten, the tangibility threshold that we'd need to spend the many many multitude of billions of dollars we would need to build that infrastructure. Well, I mean, my view would be that the carbon tax would become much more palpable if people could directly tie it and and understand that it was delivering a tangible expansion of of public transit. Um, but you're right. There's no doubt that uh, to expand the transit system. You know, you can have to have a very significant investment from senior levels of government, um, in particular on, on the capital side and the infrastructure piece. Um, and government is all about making choices. And both levels of government, it's not like they're not spending money. They're mm -hmm. post, you know, provinces posted record deficit, federal government's uh, spending um, large, large sums of money. So they are spending money. Um, and you know, maybe I believe they should be making different choices in terms of where they, they spend that money. So um, you're you're a chair of the mayor's council on yes, transportation. So you're obviously in a you're in a pretty pivotal position there um, to work with the other mayors to set priorities. Are you more of a bus guy or are you more of a SkyTrain guy? Well, uh I I don't know. When you talk about expanding would, the network dramatically. Yeah, no, I, I I mean my own view is practically uh, in terms of the the rollout and how quickly uh, it can the service can be delivered that a massive expansion of the bus service uh, should be the first priority. Um, it, it is currently the backbone of the transit system. It moves the most number of people mm -hmm. and it does it for the cheapest amount of money. And it's also the thing that can be delivered most quickly. And to me, those are three kind of boxes that are, are ticked by it. And so I have that at the top of the list. If we got to a point where uh, we have the sort of, you know, bus coverage that I think our, our region needs and we're far behind from given our population growth, um, you know, then I think, okay, uh, that's kind of first things first. Then you can look at expansion of the SkyTrain uh, system. For instance, it should be extended to Port Coquitlam, um, but uh, but I do think, practically speaking, there has to be a sequencing. Um, and if you're looking at best bang for your buck, uh, given the challenges it, it, we have, you know, getting those bucks, what you can deliver the relief uh, very quickly and impact the most number of people is hands down bus. And when you say bus, I mean there's obviously the local routes, but also the rapid bus routes yep. are are increasing and to me that's a bit of a sleeper i i think uh there's a bit of a you know a fixation with uh skytrain and rail because it's obviously seen as faster but perhaps well as yeah. more rapid bus routes get rolled out people will see the value of that well and, and that's been my uh my position at the mayor's council is we need to deliver in this region um, a, a bus rapid transit project, and it needs to be a grand slam. Mm -hmm. People need to see that, see what it can do and think, I want more of that. I want to see one of those in my community. Um, and, and that's what we're working towards. Uh, we have identified that BRT is uh, at the top of the list, a priority that we want to deliver. Um, we have established the priorities in terms of in the region. At the top of that list is going to be uh, Surrey and the King George Highway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that has the opportunity, if we can secure the uh, government, senior government funding to deliver it, to really be a game changer. Because I think people will see it. They will see how it operates. Um, it's very SkyTrain-like in terms of its speed and efficiency. And again, 
this is not reinventing the wheel. This is used in all parts of the world very successfully. Um, and I do think we need to um, sort of break the uh, the logjam that we have had here where, you know, we get one thing or we either get mega pro SkyTrain mega project, uh, which takes a decade to deliver and is billions and billions of dollars, you know, or we get, you know, a small number of buses like we have to start delivering the full spectrum of transit options that exist out there um, for a region our size with the growth that we're seeing. I think that that's really important. Your mayoral, your mayoral, 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 colleague, mayoral, mayoral colleague, uh, yeah. Mike Curley had some interesting comments in the sun today, kind of questioning the orthodoxy over um, big towers around um, transit areas, like he was Brentwood, uh, and whether they actually help with housing affordability, which I thought was pretty interesting to hear that kind of reflection given Burnaby's, um, you know, uh, history over the last uh, 20 years, or 20 plus years, and the same happening in Coquitlam. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, they'll continue to do it. But I mean, interesting your view on, on, uh, I guess municipal planning has it's really been driven by density around these transit stations. Uh, less so in Poku because you don't have a sky train out there. But uh, what's your view on that? Like, what do you think that's uh, that's the right way to go? Well, I think it makes sense from a a, a planning perspective. If you're going to have housing density, which inevitably you're going to have, you're going to have to have some higher density housing because of our limited land base. Uh, the question is, where do you put it? And it makes all the sense of, in the world that it would be located uh, in close proximity to uh, rapid transit, frequent transit, uh, which you know reduces the necessity, although it doesn't eliminate it for everyone, but certainly reduces the necessity for uh, people to have to own a vehicle. Um, some people can make that work. Not everyone can make that work. But uh, as a principle, I think it makes all the sense in the world. Now, uh, has it translated to affordable housing in those areas? No, in fact, the opposite. If you look, some of the most expensive real estate in this region uh, is the real estate that is in closest proximity is SkyTrain. Um, so I think Mayor Hurley is, is correct to identify that. And that's something that governments need to work to address. And and, um, and it will take, I think, the uh, some intervention or some involvement of government to produce a below market housing type uh, in those areas. I've heard Mayor Hurley say that if density alone uh, produced affordability, then Metro Town would have the cheapest rents in the entire region. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it doesn't. Um, so I think there's a bit more to it uh, than than just that. Although I do think that that is important and. Um, for a lot of other reasons, uh, we should be building that type of housing in proximity to frequent transit. Mm -hmm. It's funny. These are these examples, I feel like, of you. And I, I appreciate you um, uh, are not do not identify as a progressive. You do have these fits of episodic progressivism, if I can uh, offer that in these types of areas. And I want to bring bring us to one that's more recent to which um you know uh, i'm thinking of the the raises for uh for councillors and for the mayor in in Port Coquitlam which do i have it right too it's two successive years of 12.5% um you know can, can you tell me a bit why why you supported that and why you thought that was important sure uh well in, in large part because i i think there has to be some way to uh, see uh, elected officials compensated fairly. And, you know, the the fairness part is what gets hard to define because it means different things to different people. And, you know, over my years in elected office, I have seen this done, you know, many, many different ways and many, many different attempts. Um, you know, I think that it would be great if we could get to a place where there's some sort of uh, standardization around this, um, you know, like, you know, if you're, if you're an MLA, you know, you get paid, um, you know, a, a, a base amount 
Um, and all MLAs get that. Um, at the municipal level, it is is very disjointed and there's probably about, you know, two dozen different ways to do it and different cities do it different ways. Um, you know, our approach has been that, um, you know, we, we look at our, our neighbors, we look at like size cities um, and we see where we're at. Um, you know, even with uh, the increase that council uh, will receive, which is about $6,000, um, you know, Port Coquitlam Council is going to be the lowest paid council in the Tri-Cities. Um, they're, they're at about $50,000. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Even though the city of Port Moody is, you know, um, just slightly above half our size, their council is going to make more than our council. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that and our council is fine with that. But I guess the point is you can't fall too far behind. You have to stay, you know, in the realm of, of reasonableness of, of, of others. And, you know, watching this uh, play out in all the different communities, I, I think the big thing is that um, rather than going many years with no increase, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we have to, you know, catch up. So here's a big increase in a single year. Um, I, I think it makes a lot more sense and be more acceptable if, you know, you're, you're having, you know, small, gradual, modest year over year increases. Um, so, I mean, that's my, my view of it. Um, and obviously it's a, a challenging thing that and it, eventually people have to, you know, they can only at the municipal level, they only, my observation is they only outrun it for so long. And then eventually, you know, because people are falling so far behind, they have to eventually address it. Well, so in, in thinking of your council too, do most folks also do other work in addition to the counselor role? And then uh, some of them do. Some of them uh, do. Not all of them, not all of them, but some do. But well, the, but when you look at, I don't think you can look at try and you know craft it around an individual, you know, one individual circumstances because you know you're setting that you know that compensation is being set for that you know, that role and those yes. responsibilities, yeah. Um, yeah. regardless of who's in the position. I think that, I think that was, that was kind of my train of thought with it because um, I think being a city councilor is sort of one of the hardest ones to manage and contain in terms of the time you put in because of the direct access you have, the availability you have to people. I mean, that I always think of, um, even like Doug Ford uh, sort of rose to, to where he is now, basically on the back of being a city councilor who literally every single person had his cell phone. And like he would to this day defend, like it was the only way to do the job. Now, you know, I'm not sure that that literally is the only way to do the job, but certainly because you're that front line of, of, of democratic representation, you are on the ground in a way that is kind of hard to time bound. Um, and if you can't, you, and you can't live in Port Quitlam, uh, despite your fantastically low taxes, uh, even in Coquitlam off $50,000 right now. Um, so something's gotta give, right? Like, or sorry, 45,000, I think now it's up into the fifties, but something's gotta give. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, the responsibilities are are not insignificant and the decisions that you're making are are far reaching. I mean, I often come across uh, a circumstance in our city where um, I'm uh, handcuffed in terms of uh, different things I can do to improve a situation because of a decision that council made, you know, decades ago. And I and I curse them and think, you know, geez, like, why did they decide this? Because, you know. Um, so, you know, so the point is, these are, these are important roles. Um, and, and the impact of your decision making um, is far reaching in terms of the community's future. You mentioned, uh, uh, you, well, you mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a bit of a um, hodgepodge of rules between municipality and municipality. And obviously, in Metro Vancouver, I don't know, was there 21 municipalities? 21, yeah. And uh, uh, Treaty First Nation. Right. Should there be 21? I mean, would it make sense? <laughs> would it make sense to maybe have seven? Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, there are some natural groupings, the North Shore, uh, Langley. Um, Don't say cities. it. 
No, for those, my for those not watching, Ridge on Meadows. Brad, Brad West has adjusted his seat for I mean, the first time. In do you see? Do you see any value? So do you see well. any value in in uh, kind of uh, soft amalgamations, or do you think it's the way it is? Is the way it's got to be? There is no value whatsoever, Mike. Trying to put me out of a job? <laughs> Goodness. Uh, you um, could look at it as a reverse takeover. Yeah, there could be. Yeah, maybe I could run for mayor of Metro Vancouver. Hmm. There you go. Okay. There you go. Um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. It comes up with some regularity. Um, I don't know that other regions' experience with amalgamation led to, you know, uh, significant efficiencies or cost savings. Um, you know, I, I, there's even some studies that suggest the opposite. Certainly, if you're in Port Coquitlam and you've got the lowest property taxes in the region, if we were to amalgamate, your property taxes would go up. So I, I believe that the experts, we got to talk about the experts, the experts have found that it rather than like, you know, rather than reducing costs, it, it it actually can have the reverse effect and um and inflate. Okay, well, you know, but are there areas where I think municipalities can do a better job of coordinating? Absolutely, uh, because you know the residents of this region do not have their life contained to the municipal boundaries in which they mm -hmm. reside. You know, they're going to live somewhere. They may work another place. You know, the, the kids are going to have activities in different places. So, I mean, we've, I think we've done um, a, a good job or a fair job in this region and, and far better than some others in terms of that level of coordination. Can we do better? I think we can always do better in that regard. Can I offer an alternate argument for it, which is political, which is just, you know, if you look at sort of, you know, Olivia Chow, but I'm going to say more like John Tory, uh, uh, actually uh, Rob Ford and, and David Miller before them, the political heft they could have, particularly with the province, um, is huge. And actually, I'd say even on a national scale, some of the mayors of these big regions actually do have, do kind of end up holding a very prominent, powerful role. I don't know, Mayor West, if that sounds uh, appealing to you at all. But I, I'm thinking of the fact that we've had this kind of, this government in particular, sorry, I'm talking of the provincial government now, just really kind of meddling a lot in municipal business um, and kind of, you know, whether you might be better served with a more, um, with a couple of stronger voices as opposed to a bunch of disparate ones. Yeah, th that is an interesting thought. And I, I hadn't really looked at it from that angle before. Um, you know, the, the mayors have been, like the region's mayors are, you know, quite united for the most part in, in their positions um, on as it relates to um, some of the provincial intervention into uh, local government decision making. Um, but, you know, I, I do notice that when you do have so many mayors, um, you know, the government does have some ability to not pick people off. But like I do notice it's interesting sometimes to get mayors to be um, you know, endorse, endorse uh, certain uh, policies that they're mm -hmm. taking. And so, yeah, it, it, you know, there, there might be something there where, you know, if you had a, a single, you know, unified municipal government in our region that um, you'd have some stronger sway with, uh, with the province. Um, though at the same time, you know, I, I know that, you know, when particularly as you get closer to, an election, which uh, seems to be very clarifying for the soul sometimes when you get close to an election. Um, you know, the, the MLAs are, are starting to get quite responsive to their individual mayors. And so you do have, you know, um, you know, yeah, each mayor, you know, may have a handful of MLAs who represent their city. So, uh, you know, you start to have a bit of a conduit there. So uh, it's an interesting thought, though. Speaking of elections, uh, do you have a political home? Provincially? Uh, I, I'm not a member of any uh, political party um, at the moment. Um, uh, I have been a member of the uh, BC NDP in the past. Um, I spent uh, a number of years working for Mike Farnworth, 
Uh, to my election to office. Mike uh, Farnworth, he's been the member uh, of the legislature for Poco since, I believe, 1872. <laughs> Is that right? That's same Mike Farnworth. Is that right? <laughs> uh, it, you're, you're spotting him a few years, but yeah. Yeah, 1991, uh, Mike was elected as our MLA. Yeah. Yeah. And with, uh, with a, a, other than a brief period of time in exile, um, he uh, uh, he has been the MLA since then. Um, shout out to Karn Van Hess. There you go. Yeah, one term. One term. Yeah. That, that is that is true. Uh, one of our few undefeated. He's undefeated. one of our few non NDP MLAs that we've had in Port Coquitlam. Uh, Dave Barrett represented Port Coquitlam uh, in the legislature as well. Um, so, uh, but getting back to your question, um, you know, uh, Mike is uh, a friend of mine, and um, and I will be supporting him and voting for him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the NDP is evolving in different ways that I don't necessarily identify with, um, and so you know, there are things that they are doing and pursuing that I support. There are things that they are doing and pursuing that I do not support, um, but. My calculus is, again, based on my own values, uh, the values that I've been uh, raised with, the values of my community, and, and the opinion of, uh, of my residents. And that is what I reflect upon when deciding you know, what position to take on any particular issue or any particular political party. I, you know, I would also say that my exposure to political parties has made me somewhat cynical about how they operate. Um, and, and that is kind of across the board. So I'm a fairly independent minded person, as you can probably gather. I like to make decisions for myself on the basis of my beliefs and values and what I think is best for the people I represent. Um, and I think that our the culture of our political parties uh, is not healthy. And you ever, I, I, you ever. I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I, I'm not chomping at the bit to be fully immersed in it. You ever had a beer with Nathaniel Erskine Smith? No. You should. Um, I think you, I, and I'd love to join. That would be a great conversation. I'll say, can I ask you one more thing too? Like just, we gotta let you go, but. Um, you can ask me anything. Oh yeah, I love it. No, uh, cause I, I wonder, you know, the boomers tell us, uh, uh, I think because they had too much fun in the 60s, that as we age, we're going to get more conservative, less idealist, more conservative. Does that resonate for you? Is that your experience? No, I, I don't think I've gone more conservative. I, you know, I still believe in all the same things that I've always believed in. Um, I certainly think as you go through various stages uh, of life, you're you're gaining experience, um, you know, and, and that that reflects in in just about every aspect of your life, um, not just, you know, not just politics, um, you know, becoming a, a parent has changed me considerably. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm a different person or I, you know, my, my views or beliefs have changed totally. But, you know, uh, when you are responsible for the lives of your children, uh, you know, that that can have a profound impact on you. And so um, I don't know that it, it stands that you become more conservative as you get older. I, I've run into some people who have become much more left wing as they've, they've gone Thank over. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it necessarily follows. But I do think as you get older, uh, you gain more life experience. And, you know, and it's both getting older, but it's also the types of things that you're doing. I mean, uh, my the you know the opportunity I've had to serve as mayor has certainly now uh, played a significant role in shaping me in terms of you know wh what I think uh, around certain issues. And again, it's it's not it hasn't changed core values, but um, you know it, it has maybe informed me in terms of certain practicalities and certain say, and, and certain realities. Yeah. Yeah, um, and and so, um, so that so would be my a, answer. Right? You know, so I, if I, a 
if a suburban centric uh, transit obsessed um, community safety focused uh, affordability focused political movement came along <laughs> would that be something you might be interested in it it, it very well could be it, i mean it's a strong pitch mike i that's I, I, for those I'm, who watch entourage I mean, <laughs> I I, I'm not I'm not channeling. finding a lot wrong with what you've just articulated so okay well we'll just put that out there oh well well and just to say <laughs> please continue finding wrong with all the things you oh, find and resource wrong. development too oh you know, yeah okay we didn't, well, get into there, that. There you go. Uh, we didn't even talk about China so that's uh, next time. There's have too to, you'll have to have me back for round two because uh Resource development is uh, is a really important piece of our future as a province. If uh, if folks, particularly those of us who live in the Metro Vancouver, uh, think that um, you know we can disassociate ourselves from the rest of the province and the economic activity that happens there, and somehow continue to maintain our standard of living, uh, they're dreaming. And so Take that experts love experts. I, I, consider myself, I consider myself something of an expert. Of an expert. Well, that's an interesting take. Well, that, yes, <laughs> in some spheres. I mean, we have to pick apart more. And we, and I, I, honestly, we will have you back. We'll have those conversations. We will pick apart more of your nuanced view of who and who isn't an expert. Please keep giving these, these honest takes. I'm at the edge of my seat genuinely every time uh, to hear what you're going to say on something. Uh, I think a lot of our listeners are. So Mayor Brad West, thank you so much for coming, joining us at Hotel Pacifico today. Guests, last week we talked about TELUS's partnership with the Indigenous Institute. This week, I want to talk about procurement and how it shows up in TELUS's commitment to economic reconciliation. So let me tell you about Eagle Green a certified member of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Businesses founded in 2020 by Matt Holt. They provide a wide range of traffic control services, engineering, equipment rentals, product sales, sign manufacturing, and installation, and 24-7 emergency dispatch response. Around the time that Eagle Green was getting started, TELUS was actively looking for a partner to assist with the rollout of pure fibre internet in communities across British Columbia, including Seychelles, Gabriola Island, Hope, and Princeton. In its first month of operations, Eagle Green had five employees. Today, they have over 60. Eagle Green presently services roughly 60% of TELUS's jobs in the Greater Vancouver region, Howe Sound, and the Fraser Valley. Noteworthy clients include the Squamish and Tawasan First Nations. Founder Matt Holt credits the sustained backing from TELUS as he envisions expanding Eagle Green's impact to encompass Vancouver Island and potentially the British Columbia interior. You can learn more about TELUS's commitment to economic reconciliation at telus.com backslash reconciliation. Hello, you've reached the Hotel Pacifico Strategy Suite. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you. Uh, so we do have, it, it seems like um, asking you shall receive, we are compiling a lot more of reviews, which I'm really glad to see. Uh, Mike, you have any recent favorites? Well, we're getting reviews. They're just not necessarily going to the right place. What do you mean? They're just coming directly. People are texting me with reviews. They're um, reviewing got, you to you? I got one from the Santa Monica kid who uh, said he's been negligent in awarding stars for, stars for the Hotel Pacifico episodes, which he's listened to. It's a not-to-miss podcast. So many great conversations. And when I replied rather tartly that maybe he could actually do a review online he responded that maybe we could book lunch in kingfisher <laughs> true listener so uh, thank you very much thank you santa monica <laughs> kid uh, for that um but we are getting lots of great feedback so appreciate all the you know whether their reviews are in the right place or not it's nice to get the feedback so thank yes. you yeah to all those people who are sending us notes and things we do like the text we could actually, I mean, it might be fun to read some of the reviews we get uh, just to ourselves uh, that the that other folks don't get to read on the platforms, but uh, message received. Uh, I did notice shared. that on yeah. uh, Apple, we're now averaging 4.9 stars. <gasps> I haven't rooted out where the uh, less than five review came from, but uh, I'll just assume probably Glenn Clark. <laughs> There For someone from Kingfisher. Yeah, stop talking about him. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, someone from Kingfisher or or um no, maybe so. angered yeah. angered listeners in Esquimalt. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, there was that. There was that. There was that. We are we are we're building up the enemies, gentlemen. Well, let's move it on then, because actually we do we have so much to cover today. It's an embarrassment of riches for the strategy suite. Um, I want to start uh, with you, Jeff, and with the news out of uh, Little Mountain over the weekend, which is that the nomination has gone to Councillor Christine Boyle. I think we knew that would be a huge race, but I definitely think at certain points, certainly it looked like that was uh, that was Andrea Reimers uh, to win. Uh, what happened over the weekend? I don't think it happened over the weekend. I think it happened uh, months ago. But uh, just for those who didn't hear last time, I'm not a voter in that race, but I was a supporter of Andrea's. Uh, they're both strong candidates, but I've known Andrea for years. The um, the signups began uh, some time ago, and and so I think Christine did very well in terms of reaching out to people early on, and Andrea did less so. She said that in uh, public comment she made afterwards, acknowledging the defeat. But also, uh, Christine got tremendous support from Kaylee Lynch, Premier Eby's wife, who came to the meeting and gave a uh, powerful speech. In oh, she spoke time. at the meeting. Oh, she spoke at the oh, meeting. Oh, so there are actually speeches. Oh, that's interesting. Very short. The total amount of yeah. time for each candidate was only five minutes, and it was very strictly mm -hmm. regulated. So Andrea was right. endorsed by Kasalem from Squamish First Nation and uh, George Heyman, of course, the incumbent MLA. But Kaylee Lynch spoke for Christine Boyle and talked about their long, long, long friendship and uh, her strong feelings of support for uh, wow. for Christine. So it was uh, it was full on, <clears throat> and um, and I think. Uh, the, the number of votes cast overall, I think, was accurately reported. It was only about 155. So there was a short campaign where uh, obviously Christine had done a good job early on. And uh, that and uh, the support she got was enough to overcome what was a very strong campaign for Andrea Reimer. Yeah. So uh, David Eby will have Christine Boyle there. And then there'll be a by-election. If she's successful, which looks like she will be, um, it's a pretty safe seat, although nothing's ever totally safe. So that will trigger a by-election, which I think will be welcomed by Mayor Ken Sim, because um, it's hard to imagine that we could find somebody with Christine Boyle's profile to hold a seat in a by-election. But maybe. We'll see. What Civic by-elections oh, are yeah. settled by a very yeah, small we, we can have that argument some other time, but I actually think I would be surprised if, if um, ABC won that by-election. Yeah. I, I, uh -huh. I just think they have so many seats on council that I think sometimes the voters want to you know, balance out the voices, and this would be a time where... Yeah, it's hard to see who would come in, uh, but there's somebody there, no doubt, so we'll see. Well, is this some of what I think I want to bring it back to uh, Andrea Reimer's uh, LinkedIn post um, when she, um, over the weekend, uh, talking about the results and celebrating coming in within 12 votes, um, and I think she points out, as you mentioned, Jeff, that she had a later start than, than Christine, um, and, and I'll just read directly um, and quote, uh, for those speculating I might consider a run in a council by-election, the answer is a simple no. I already did everything I could to keep a progressive voice at the council table. It's on those who felt differently to deal with that loss. Um, a little bit of shots fired there, yeah. Well, I mean, ever since, um, you know, Andrea and I both served on council at the same time. I left a bit before. She did 10 years. She was also a senior roles at Metro and everything else. So the idea that she would go back and start over again, I think, was a bit far-fetched, so you can maybe understand some of her reaction. But but since um, the vision team disappeared and has uh, vanished from the political scene for the most part, defeated twice decisively, the rest of the civic left has proved itself unable to do very much at all. Christine Boyle ran twice on behalf of one city, and were, they were not able to expand their support. Um, and so, you know, leave it for a different show, maybe that's based on civic politics to figure out why that's the case. But at the moment, um, you know, after Kennedy Stewart, there is there is very little there. One of the most high profile, I suppose, left of center people is actually Pete Fry. But uh, Adrian Carr, a veteran of provincial and civic politics, has been much quieter this term. It'll be very good. I think it'll be quite difficult. Uh, perhaps someone will come along who is not part of any organization and do well, because as Mike says, it's easier in a by-election sometimes to to make a well, statement. You might, see, uh, otherwise. you might see someone from the more taxpayer side that's frustrated with property tax yeah. hikes and mm -hmm. and you know maybe there's something you know who knows right but, uh, but I back to broken, the broken record on this topic but it's not like it used to be to start organizations in in politics period because yeah. you need fundraising capacity and you cannot have it from institutional sources and so uh, in the old days uh, the civic left there was always some labor support not anymore mm. so back to the nomination the little mountain um 
so whatever it was 83 to 72 it's like okay on one on one hand you know you got probably 30,000 voters in Vancouver Little Mountain and their likely MLA was selected by 83 people who actually showed up to vote in a nomination meeting and took out a party membership card. It does seem like a very low number of people who ultimately decide who the MLA is going to be. Mm -hmm. However, that's 82 more than are deciding most candidates in British Columbia this election because wow. most are getting appointed by, boom, strike of the pen by the leader. So hats off to Little Mountain for having a nomination race. But you know, it would be nice in Mike McDonald's perfect vision of the world where lots of people joined political parties and had robust nomination races to select candidates. That would be lovely. And Jeff, well, think, your, your yeah. nomination race with him and many years ago, you guys had bigger numbers than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, twice as big. But but I would say this, and we both did signups for months and it was very difficult. And George, uh, you know, beat me soundly, uh, as my daughter said, did not humiliate me, but beat me soundly. But he had a, you know, a very, very good campaign. I thought I had a reasonable one. We had a hard time signing people up. It's not a constituency where you get, uh, you know, 100 here, 100 there or anything else. But Mike, uh, soon to come, uh, competitive races, at least on the NDP side, certainly in uh, Sunshine Coast, there's yeah. four or five teeing off there. Uh, there's a number of other constituencies that are about to get uh, green lighted for nominating meetings. And there will be some uh, hard fought races, I think, in Yaletown in the heart of the city as well. All right. Well, All right, we'll sure keep an watch. eye on that. We will. And we'll be spending a little more time in uh, Mike McDonald's uh, vision of an ideal world when we come back to this listeners. But first, uh, we have a clipping. So I'm using the most liberal application of that word. And as a former journalist, I have to say, I'm sort of feeling I'm, I'm my skin is itchy, like because we have a clipping and it comes from TikTok. Um, but I think in this case, there's a really great case to use this as a clipping because I'm obviously talking about Chase Barber. Uh, I think he's the CEO, founder of, um, of Edison Motors, right? Uh, electrical, like heavy duty truck company who I have to say it is a very artfully done TikTok about eight minutes, unscripted, clearly authentic, which lays out a story, a very compelling story. Um, using also good some helpful backdrops and i have a question about the what the map is behind him and most of it but sorry to get to the well get, yeah and and yeah. based in merit as well based in merit okay yeah. maybe that maybe that's edifying as to the map but i'll say the the point i think we need we need to get across about that TikTok right is laying out a story of what it is to be a company that clearly lives closely at the intersection of the energy transition and sort of the objectives of clean bc to have not received any government grants to have and then to find out the company mnp that's been pitching you on their grant writing services is actually also adjudicating uh, those grants or administering those grants, mm -hmm. and then to find out subsequently from there, uh, basically to have um, uh, no cooperation or real support uh, in his telling of the story from uh, the Minister of Energy's office in addressing this concern. Uh, Mike, I think, does this one, does this story lend fire, I There's think, a lot. to the to the opposition's critic. There's a lot to unpack here. BC. There's a lot to yeah. unpack here. Well, first yeah. of all, let me start with um, the complainant, Chase Barber. Okay. Seems oh, like okay. a young guy. Yeah. Um, so Edison Motors uh, has a huge uh, TikTok following, and so does Chase Barber himself. Chase Barber, I looked it up, uh, has over 800,000 followers on TikTok. And, and that is because he started doing TikToks as a trucker talking about trucking stuff and then just started getting a following. And the company has done the same with social media. So that post that went viral, that... Well, it started morning, viral. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, well, well, it started of, viral. <laughs> yeah, viral. Anyway, as of this morning, 564,000 views on that video. Oh gosh. And 62,000 60, likes. 62, likes. So <laughs> a politician would only dream of those numbers, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So how many of those are in BC? I don't know. Enough, right? China knows. Yeah, China knows. China knows exact. China's got all the stats. Um, but yeah, the point is, is the first time I've seen a TikTok video, uh, coming to the political realm in such a fashion. So that's new and noteworthy. 
And here's a, uh, a business person who most business people just, you know, write a letter if they're mad. Here's a guy that just went ballistic. Well, he didn't and, write a letter first. Well, true. But that's where it ends for most I people. Know, <laughs> I actually want to know how old Chase Barber is. But I think there's, this, and there's an important point there. Because I think he's an Every, effective Everybody TikToker. looks young from where I'm sitting, but he's pretty <laughs> young. And yeah. Uh, yeah. he's younger than Jeff. Is that he yeah. builds uh, logging trucks or a special kind of truck that are kind of built to order by the trucker. So they they say, Chase, I want a truck that does this, that, the other has the following kinds of uh, power. And it's really like building a, getting a tailored suit. And he pioneered this electric logging truck thing, which sounds like the last place you would see a breakout of electrification. Um, and, and he's got a great reputation of falling for all those reasons. So, um, yeah. So Steven, I, I would love to see, you know what I would love to see? My dream video would be, you know, you can watch like the reaction videos of people watching TikToks. I would love to see Kevin Falcon watching that TikTok. I would pay a lot to see that. <laughs> what do you anticipate his reaction to be? Well, because from his standpoint, I think he looks really prescient on the clean BC stuff. Like, I think this gives them the most credible, um, accessible, viral critique of the clean BC plan that I think we've seen to date. They've been sort of just saying like, ah, eh, it's, you know, it's just, they haven't really had the concrete manifestation of the waste they proclaim is behind mm -hmm. that program. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the thing that this puzzled to me I went back and looked at it a second time, sort of on the QP side and so on, was that it burbled along um, in the in question period last week. And maybe if there was a bigger press gallery these days, we would have heard more about it. But it was mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. the government was saying, no, you know, we've taken a look at this. We don't think that there's any um, fire with that smoke. And, and we don't really think it should go to the Auditor General, which is one of the pieces of business they did on Thursday. And I would say going to the Auditor General is kind of like the, the a hammer it is a big hammer to take to what initially was uh, looked to mm -hmm. me like a fly. Uh, yeah. If there's something going on there, then the, pol the uh, public service should be able to tell you very quickly and you should be able to put a stop to it because you've got a contractor out there, an MNP, that are facing allegations of wrongdoing. Clearly, the behavior would be out of bounds if it was if it was happening. So, uh, but the clearly, they didn't even pick that step because I think that's part of Chase's story is, right, that then... That then MMP, he finds that MMP is going to be leading the reevaluation of the business case for, I think it's for like transportation or for electrical. Well, he was heavy trucks. because uh, he took, after being uh, ignored in his mind at the provincial level with the ministry in February, he then went to the opposition, which, you know, that happens. And the opposition took it into the legislature last week on a couple of occasions and tried to get a motion passed, which all the opposition parties supported to refer the matter to the attorney general, but the government used its majority to reject the that general. Vote, right? Uh, so then over the weekend, Josie Osborne had an epiphany and got new information, which actually warranted an immediate referral to the auditor general. And that was why yesterday the opposition and Todd Stone were saying the new information was the TikTok. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, in the absence of alternative facts, uh, I, I can't, you know, can't hard to disagree with them. The new information might've been that she was called to the principal's office um mm -hmm. uh because uh, a, a growing mess was happening under her watch mm. which i'm sure premier's office wasn't too keen on on seeing happen and this is you know the the i wouldn't say the body count is stacking up but there's been some damaged ministers over the last couple of months uh nathan cullen on the land act obviously lost selena robinson and uh now josie osborne's getting roughed up a little bit um I think I'm missing one in there somewhere. I mean, the finance ministers, you know, was talking about the credit down. That's sort of down rating, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, budget was down, or uh, BC's finances, whatever you call it, debt rating. I know Jeff credit, loves the, the bond S rating agencies. S&P credit rating, right? We've been downrated. Yeah. Standard, yeah. yeah, yeah, standard and poor. So, so that's uh, you know not a great look. I mean, that's just a bit of an echo from the February budget, obviously. But um, you know, I think governments hasn't exactly been uh, on top of uh, getting its positive message out like it probably wants to right now, five months out from an election. It's dealing with all these little brush fires here and there. Well, the interesting thing about the S&P downgrade too, I'll say, uh, and I won't spend too much time on this, but I, I just want to say like it's, um, 
one of those things, and I think even Brian, you maybe when he was on sort of pointed out that we could afford a, a downgrading credit and it just, the impact would be pretty insignificant. I think the problem with this one for the government is that it's really getting tied up in this broader conversation that everyone's obsessed about, which is the Bank of Canada and the overnight interest rate and when they're going to lower. And basically the case, what, what's been put out there now into the ether with BC is like the lit, the poster child for it, um, is that provincial spending is what is preventing the Bank of Canada reaching its target of 2% uh, of inflation. So this is like this is where I'm like, ooh, you couldn't have seen this one coming, but you're really, unfortunately, probably going to get a little more heat than you might have predicted on what, at the end of the day, a credit downgrade for BC is not catastrophic. Our credit's already fantastic. Sorry, well, Jeff. Yeah. Um, we worried about this. I mean, we talked about this when the budget came down. And we see the other... Um, we see other provinces running significant uh, deficits and we'll see what the reaction is. There's, there's two other agencies that did not downgrade BC. Yes. Standard and Poor's yes. continues to see a lot of strength in the economy and all that kind of thing. What's missing in their mind, if I read between the lines, is a plan to get the deficit or a willingness to, you know, bend a knee at the altar of uh, balanced budgets. And I think that's uh, that was something that was worrying a lot of people when the budget came down, uh, was whether or not the... Uh, failure to project even a point at which there would be balance was a problem. That's what Standard & Poor's is pointing to. I think in BC politics, uh, the credit rating is a big deal. Does it deserve to be a big deal? Uh, maybe not as much as it is. Uh, so I think that's a bit of an issue. And and to Mike's point about the set, like, you know, at this point in a session, everybody in that building can't wait to get out. It's like there's two or three weeks left now until I think the scheduled end of the uh, June set session. This is the last sitting of this you know, legislature, the elections coming up. So people are just trying to to get their way across that finish line. It's not been a great uh, period for Kevin Falk, and that's for sure. I think we're going to turn to that topic next. So uh, everybody will be uh, kind of pleased to get back out onto the uh, hustings, I think, because uh, we're getting ready for the next act now. Well, thanks for setting us up, because, yeah, that's where we're going next. Because we have, I think, new, new poll numbers, new fundraising numbers, um, about that that are kind of illuminating some of what's happening with the BC Conservatives and BC United. I'll start with the fundraising numbers because they're a bit more straightforward. Uh, NDP at 4.1 million for last quarter, uh, BC United at 3 million. This is, this is for last year. Last year, sorry. Yeah, I said last quarter, last year. Last year. Um, for last year. And then 440,000 uh, for the BC Conservatives. The Greens did not file, which in a less jam-packed episode, listeners, we would totally spend some time on. I think they've been stopping, but we will we will linger right now on the, uh, on the BC, BC United and the BC Conservatives. So certainly the machinery for BC United is still working well. The polls, however, uh, not so much to the degree that even, I think BC United kind of tried to spin some poll, some poll results uh, last week. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain that, Mike? Well, what Leger poll, was it Leger? It was Leger poll came out last week and again had uh, Conservative second and uh, BC United third. Unfortunately for BC United, they ill-advisedly um, tweeted out some spin that they were gaining against the Conservatives in the polls, comparing the Leger poll to the Main Street poll and that they had gone up while the conservatives had come down because uh, I just can't begin to even but, don't but know where do. to start on this but tweet do. because <laughs> as uh, first of all comparing one poll to one company's poll to another company's poll and that stuff it looked desperate and also it's like hey we're gaining on the conservatives I, like Kevin Falk has been very consistent all the way through he is not listening to the polls. And the polls are wrong, and he's right. And just like 2013, they're going to be fine, and they're going to go all the way. And then someone decided to get hold of the <laughs> Twitter account and said, hey, we're gaining on the conservatives. It's yeah. like, we've got the momentum. And and anyway, the little sideshow on Twitter on this was, uh, or X, whatever it's called, was the BC conservatives having a field day uh, saying, like, this is so embarrassing, right? Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. you bc united so anyways if you're not going to spin the polls don't spin the polls right if you say you're not going to spin the polls then don't spin the polls you know if you are going to spin the polls don't spin when you're third you know so anyways i digress well but um, in falcon's 
uh, behalf. I can't believe I'm saying that, but um, <laughs> they they had a rally. Like they've got a plan. They had a rally yeah. on the weekend. Yeah, the, they had a good the, crowd the on the weekend. Was full. Like they're ticking those boxes. He's getting out around the province, that kind of thing. And their fundraising did go up 14, percent which is accurately reported. You know, mm-hmm. over the same period, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. But the Conservatives had a huge surge in fundraising. Um, you know, well, and the, compared to nothing. Was, yeah. They, yeah. They, yeah. Well, compared to eighty-four thousand dollars getting up into uh, whatever the number yeah, was. But, but wouldn't you want if you're like crushing it in the polls, right? And you're like so clearly the opposition. And then I think we had the one even that had them like really on the heels of the NDP, mm-hmm. right? Like, wouldn't you want? Wouldn't you expect millions? Like. If it, if not then if not then then when like well sure absolutely you would but but it's a it's a much more muscular showing than the conservatives but the other yeah. one that, no we never talk about is the green party which raised 1.2 million more than the conservatives and uh, you have mm-hmm. to wonder what's happening in that outfit and how that's going to play and I think that could have uh, some consequences if they're not able to get their act together a bit more than they have up till now in uh, in the coming months. We spent but, some time. Go ahead, Mike. Well, just yeah. to the point, though, like, uh, you're right. The BC, I can't remember which one of you is right, but BC <laughs> United oh. did have a showing of strength with the fundraising last year, not as much as the NDP, but they had over 10, about 10,000 donors. NDP had 15,000 donors. Conservatives had about 3,800. So BC United still has relative strength there. They're still getting people out like they did last weekend to a big campaign college and hundreds of people out and lots of excited videos online, that type of thing. So like they still got a pulse. They're still out there working. Conservatives are obviously out there working. It's a stalemate, you know, right now, it seems the poll results indicate that the relatives, both parties aren't as strong as the NDP, but together they potentially could be something bigger. Are you setting up your big bang theory? Yeah. I am setting up my big bang theory of we've gone through this before in BC where the free enterprise side has been realigned. The question is, are we due now? Are, are we at that point now or later after the election? So I wrote a little blog post it's mm-hmm. there for the universe to have a look I was going to set it up for you. Okay. I'll set it up for you. So you don't have, we to. don't have hey, music listener, for that. Though, I know we? we need, okay. We need, we need, you know, Substack and, and blog music, but so listeners, you can go um, to Mike's blog at Rose Deer to, to see his, his theory and all its resplendence and it's historical a, rigor. Uh, it's also on air quotes media. It's also on air quotes media. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So yeah. and all its historical re- um, rigor. Uh, but I think Mike, you are sorry, Jeff, you and I did get a chance to have a look at this before the episode. Um, do you think Mike's right? Like, are we on the precipice of another big bang of a coming together? Yeah, we abs- well, there has to be because uh, the conservative forces, the right side forces, whether they're conservative or maybe federal liberal people who don't like the New Democrats, of which there's a group, um, need a political vehicle. They don't have one at the moment. And uh, either they'll, but I think Mike and I may disagree on timing. My, my view is mm-hmm. the two center right parties or right parties have, have gone too far down the road now separately to unite before the vote. They need to see how strong each of them really is. And then maybe after the vote, they'll figure it out either quickly or not quickly. Uh, And I I say quickly or not quickly, meaning if they were able to get within striking distance of uh, of purporting to form government, I think there'd be tremendous external pressure from people in the business community and elsewhere for them to do that, or for one of the leaders to get out of the way or both to get out of the way, who knows? Uh, The the creative strengths that, that those, people in that world find when their backs are against the wall are really remarkable. Um, so I think that we'll, we'll see. Uh, they could they could take a long time to do this, though, because it's, if there's a big defeat for Kevin Falcon, for example, he may, you know, if, if, for example, he was to be heavily defeated, I don't think it's certain yet that that's the case at all, uh, he might leave on election night, or he might not. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think those are all going to be very interesting questions to sort out. But the campaign will be crazy, I think, because I don't know what your view is, Mike. You know, earned media is not what it was, but the debate will be quite significant. And then the effectiveness mm-hmm. of the social media campaign will be very important in how. Uh, yeah, how I'm not sure the debates that. are as important as they used to be, in part because there's so much early voting now. Um, yeah, that's true. Which which is part of it. Like these things are getting baked further in advance. Mm-hmm. But. Right now, I think what's unique about this situation is that um, there's a uh, hanging in a fortnight scheduled here, as the old saying goes, hanging in a fortnight concentrates the mind. 
And, uh, you know, right now, both parties, the opposition parties can be staring into the abyss, even though the conservatives are delighted that they're even in the conversation right now and winning, you know, five seats would be something they haven't done since like the seventies. But if you seriously want to contend for power, like it's, you're not looking at victory right now. In my opinion, the conservatives may feel that way because they're just so they, they're, they're, curve has been like this right now and they don't want to stop it but eventually with bc united there that will be a break on their growth and vice versa so that's why i think i wouldn't rule out i wouldn't rule out something happening before the election i agree with you that jeff that it's unlikely uh it really comes down to resolve it just comes down to both resolve among the players the political players but it also comes down to the resolve of the support base and whether people are just willing to go along with it, uh, whatever happens, or whether something happens externally. So, are you are you rejecting the wisdom of our air quotes colleague Corey Tanek, Mike? That this would take years and years and years. I don't listen to experts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Brad West, uh, our guest earlier, put his finger on a very tough strategic problem for the New Democrats, which is the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. And, and, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, uh, we, it wasn't the same big deal here. I don't think uh, that it was in other jurisdictions where Manitoba, for example, they are still figuring out what they're going to do about that. We've had carbon tax now since Gordon Campbell, as, uh, as Brad West pointed out. However, um, you know, who sees, we'll see how it plays. Uh, it's a, um, it's a tricky one uh, in many respects in, in an election where affordability is going to be the key, even though, I agree with those who say it's not the affordability cause that people think it is. Yeah, I think we're going to, well, exactly. And I think whatever Wab Canoe does in Manitoba, we're going to have to follow it here closely because I think that is an interesting challenge to see played out by a popular NDP premier. All right. Well, this has been a jam-packed episode. Gentlemen, should we go grab a drink? Last week, I was talking about those cold snaps when we really need energy to keep us warm and cozy. But it's not just a matter of cranking up the thermostat. It's also about using energy more efficiently. Our sponsor, Fortis BC, recently announced it will invest a record $695.8 million to help its customers reduce their energy use over the next four years. It's a key pillar in the company's goal to lead the clean energy transformation in BC and reduce consumers' energy use, not to mention bringing down energy costs for consumers and businesses. Efficiency measures make a ton of difference. 740,000 tons, in fact. That's how many tons of CO2 emissions will be reduced over the life of these measures, equivalent to taking more than 228,000 passenger cars off the road. Don't worry, my car's in the garage. I walk to work. These measures are all part of Fortis BC's Clean Growth Pathway to 2050 and an important contribution to helping Canada meet its pledge to double energy efficiency by 2030. Hotel Pacifico's window to the world is triple paned, and Fortis BC is there to help. Energy for a better BC and a better podcast. Let's raise a glass or take a shot. Time to raid the mini bar. I'd like to raise a glass to our um, former Lieutenant Governor Iona Campanello, who passed away this week. Um, by all accounts, I think she. I mean, there's been many good LGs in British Columbia, but I think she will be remembered as one of the best, if not the best, uh, for the way she carried herself, not just as an LG, but also as a cabinet minister, um, a leading uh, female voice in the Liberal Party back in the day. She was party president for a while. She was a broadcaster. She was, I believe, the first chancellor of UNBC, chair of the Fraser Basin Council, many, many things that were uh, public-spirited endeavors and uh just wanted to note her passing and her her legacy uh also i'll add in a second glass to a uh, historical vagrant someone who belongs in another century uh my friend uh daniel marshall who has just seen his book published untold tales of british columbia that is uh, ronsdale press which is hitting the bookshelf soon that it will be a hot summer read for BC politicos who want to go back in the time capsule and learn why we are the way we are in BC. But uh, I guarantee you it'll be a, a great summer read for people. Good. Definitely pick that up. 
All right, Jeff. Well, I'm going to raise a glass to uh, Angelo Isidoro, who I've never met, but he's the, uh, I guess, the executive director of the Conservative Party of BC, because he's a man of action on every front. Mike has explained uh, how he punctured the balloon of BC United when they made uh, the extremely uh, risky and uh, crazy poll comparisons. He was out very quickly uh, just saying that they were pathetic, but also he's uh, had to end the political careers of two conservative candidates in short order, both who were associated with the, um, with the anti-vax uh, side of the world. Uh, one who had been had suspended by the BC College of Physicians and Surgeons, a Ladysmith uh, physician, who a uh, very, very uh, strong anti-vax uh, physician who lost his uh, medical privileges for that reason, but also believe that if you took vaccine, you're at risk of becoming magnetized. I so <laughs> um, I, I, I think uh, I would just recommend to Mr. Isidoro that he step up Polar, the vetting game over there Kennedy. at the Conservative Party. And I just want to know, was, where, where was the line crossed? Was it the anti-vax position itself or was it the magnetism that finally broke them when it came to uh, supporting Mr. H Dr. Hansworth, former Dr. Hansworth's uh, candidacy? Anyway, cheers to uh, Angelo Isidoro. Cheers, Tim. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a shot at some junctures. Um, I, I'm going to take a shot today. I think Jeff raised a shot. I think so. Think shot? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, that's a new I move. I like that. Too black and white. <laughs> he raised a shot. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm, I'm taking a shot, but I'm taking a shot that is going to break me. Like I'm going to have to like pray to the feminist gods and do my feminist absolutions after this one because Greta Gerwing, forgive me, because I want to take a shot at Christopher Freeland. And I want to take a, Chris, a shot at Christopher Freeland in a way that I, I would think I would never do because... Some honorable members. Oh, oh. Yes. Well, the, the, so we do, I, I hate... I hate <laughs> when we spend time talking about the wardrobe of female politicians. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because uh, Christopher Freeland, Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland was in uh, Victoria uh, earlier this week doing an announcement about affordable housing. You know, it's this this loan construction loan program the feds have, and, and she was showing off some new apartments that were built. And it's interesting because there was some back and forth about the fact that these apartments that they were showing off were actually above, I think, the average market rate, which I actually think is not surprising and kind of forgivable. But I think what made it so hard to pull off was if you're going to an affordable housing announcement, like don't bring the pearls unless you are actually channeling, like wanting to channel Marie Antoinette, just leave the string of pearls at home, please. It just is what makes it so hard to bring any nuance or actually like rationale to this, this moment in that announcement. And so- She's trying to be authentic, Kate. You know- To herself. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You do you, just don't put on the pearls. Just like when you're about to go out the door, don't put the string of pearls on. So sorry, I, you know, call me out for this one. I know it's not talking about wardrobe, but um, I look at the the photos, the art from that that, that announcement and it is not right. I All right. Wear Ken Sims wardrobe, but I'll leave that for another show. Yeah, hoodies. Yeah, and that's how I'll balance it out actually karmically. Like we'll come back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, one on a, I'll take a shot at Ken Sim for the hoodie or other 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 sartorial choices and uh you know uh you'll be here to 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 join me in that listeners so i want to thank everyone i want to thank our guest brad west for joining us today uh, i want to thank our presenting sponsors talus and portis bc we will see you next week guests bc you can never leave check out time at hotel pacifico we hope you enjoyed your stay